boom, it's mind pump time. Did you know that working out harder might actually be killing your gains? They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. Also, did you know calf raises may actually improve your metabolism? That's right, stop skipping calf day. In the second half of the show, we answer three live callers questions about, hey, can I absorb more than 30 grams of protein in one sitting? And also, what should I do if I have chronic shoulder pain when pressing? Would you love to have short clips to share with your friends and family? Well, you can find it over at our other YouTube channel, Mind Pump Clips. Go over there and subscribe. All right, enjoy the show. Here's a fitness fact. Working out harder is not always better. In fact, sometimes, it's the worst possible thing you can do, contrary to what you might read or see on social media. Working out harder, not always the answer. You know, I'm, I'm bringing this up because, have you guys seen that Brazilian trainer, that female trainer, I think her name is Carol Vaz, I think, hmm. right? And she like makes her clients cry and scream. In, <laughs> I think in I've videos. heard you talk about her, but I don't know if I've seen her. Punishes Doug, bring, them. Bring, up, bring a video of her up. It's So if you're a trainer and you've trained people for more than a month, <laughs> you actually work with people, Yeah, watching a video like this is like nails on a chalkboard because it- um, well, Is it used, like watching Biggest Loser? Yeah, I was going to say, this used to be a Julie worse. Michaels title, right? Uh -huh. The America's it, Toughest Trainer It's or worse than Biggest Loser because um, uh, it-, it I think when you watch Biggest Loser, you think there's an entertainment aspect. This is like, yeah, this is serious. This is what you need to do when you train and you work out. It's terrible. <laughs> the world's most hardcore. That's a terrible title. Oh, oh no. These are her clients literally are crying. Look at this. <laughs> They're crying and she's doing like, I don't know, 15 forced reps. Uh, with the exercises and, you know, make matters worse. She um, looks like they're in labor. She represents these female uh, fitness, I guess, celebrities or whatever that look pretty good. Wow. So I guess you would watch it and say, oh my God, the results, you know, speak for themselves. But yeah, she's literally crying through that entire uh, set. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah. What people need to realize is um, intensity is, uh, it's a factor in workout programming. And like any factor, there's a right dose. And too much only is going to make you get slower results, less results, hurt yourself. You're not going to progress any better if you train beyond uh, the appropriate level for your body of intensity. That's the important thing. You know why I think it's it's always hard to communicate this one because I, I think there's like two ends of the spectrum of the, of the clientele. It's like you have this clientele that um, – is so adverse to, to exercise or doing any sort of movement. And so, you know, teaching them to learn to push through and, and to challenge themselves and, and go harder than they're used to going has some merit. But then you have the other end of the spectrum of people that enjoy working out that, and, and the truth is the people that gravitate towards a trainer like this are the ones that don't need it. And the ones that are like, hell yeah. no, I don't That's want to always happens. Yeah. Hell no. I don't want nothing to do with this trainer would probably benefit the most from the, from the mentality. Sample, yeah. right? well, nobody, nobody should probably train like that. It's a very, very, the, the risk versus reward, the, uh, the um, uh, amount of stress that you're applying to the body is unnecessary to get it to change the way you want to. Like, so I, I just, but I mean, people see it and they get motivated. That's it's 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 feeding into the whole motivation hype. Yeah, thing and there's still. there's more to the unnecessary aspect of it because some people may say, okay, it's unnecessary, but okay, what's the harm then if I just work out hard? Well, it's not just unnecessary; it actually will will move you away from your goals. It'll mm -hmm. make the results happen slower or not at all. Is actually what ends up happening when you use the inappropriate level of intensity. Because when you watch videos like this. If you're the average person, let's say you just got motivated, you want to start working out, right? So you see these videos. One of two things is going to happen. Either one, you're like, okay, this is not for me. There's no way. I don't want to do that. I don't want to cry. Like, this is crazy. Like, this yeah. is not for me. Or you're in that state of motivation and you're like, this is what I need to do if I want to get in shape. So then you go to the gym and you beat the crap out of yourself and you get terrible results or worse, you hurt yourself and you're like, oh, okay, well, I guess this isn't for me. Yeah, even if you get results, it's a very brief window when it, when you're ramping the intensity up to that level. And uh, in terms of like you going over the threshold of your body being able to adapt, it's, it's very much more likely that you're just going to be healing at that point from the damage you caused because you went so extreme. Well, it's, yeah. like, it's like an ultra marathon runner racing against the fastest sprinter in the world. 
and you and you and the fastest sprint in the world, even though the fastest sprint in the world is most likely not going to win that ultra marathon race against the ultra marathon runner. And it's and that's why I think it's deceiving is because you see these people come out the gates. You train that hard and the and the results come on much faster than the ultra marathon runner that probably takes off on a nice little mm -hmm. pace and the sprinter takes off. And I was like, oh my God, he's gonna crush him. It's like, no, wait. Wait about 15 miles <laughs> yeah. and we'll and we'll see where where everybody is at. And then ultimately you'll see the ultra marathon passer. Right. So I think the same thing goes with this is that it's deceiving because you see you, you, the results come out the gates. You come out the gates and the scale goes down fast and you feel the body tightening up really quick. And so you think that, you know, this is the way I want to. You know, to I think it. that that mainly happens with people who are already fit. You take the average person and you train them with that level of intensity. They're not going to see results. They're going to be either hurt or in bed or nothing. They're not going to get any. Results. Well, I mean, okay, yeah. You that. take a fit person. I mean, what you and you throw the occasional you, you, super intense you do, workout. You do that, right? She's that. This trainer is on the far end of the spectrum, yeah. you know. But I mean, you even there and there's trainers that are training n not near that intensity, but still training way too intense for a new beginner. Sure. And that new beginner ultimately is going to see results. They were they weren't moving, they were eating poorly, and now they get a trainer who decides they're going to kick their ass. Yeah. And so, you know, the first couple of weeks they see good results. And you know what? It's it's not even an opinion. Um, there's there's been a lot of studies done on this, so it's not just uh, our opinion and our experience. There's a lot of lot of data on this. Lots of studies that show what what level of intensity is most effective, like lifting to failure versus not lifting to failure, volume, frequency, rep ranges. There's lots of studies done on this, and the studies are pretty conclusive that these super high levels of intensity are not just unnecessary, but in a very short period of time, overwhelm the body's ability to adapt. Yep. So you actually get worse results. So like what she's doing these videos with this particular, and, and it's going viral. It's gone viral a couple of times. I've seen her before in the yeah. past. When you watch that level of intensity, she's not just going to failure. She's going to failure. She's doing partial reps, forced reps, negative. Like she's throwing everything but the kitchen sink yeah. at these people. And so you watch this and you're like, oh, is that what I need to do? Yeah. Do you, do you think it's very damaging? Do to, you guys think it's getting well, worse or better in our space? You know what's funny? I'm I'm so glad you asked that question because uh, hmm. I think if you go on social media, it's a bit distorted in terms of what's happening. So I now work out at a regular commercial gym. I started going back, so now I'm in like the regular population. So it's not like a super hardcore gym. It's not. It's just a gym where people work out, and I'm seeing a lot of good stuff. Like I'm seeing people do really good technique and formal barbell exercises, full ranges of motion, appropriate levels of intensity rest periods that look good. So based off that, I think it's a lot better than it was before. But if I look at social media, it's like, man, I get discouraged. Do you agree, Justin? <laughs> really well, fast. I'm trying to think about that because remember Brittany, I forget her last name. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, she got in trouble uh, for promoting all these programs and then not like following through with all these customers and whatnot. And so I'm wondering if a little bit of that was a deterrent for some of these influencers to actually, you know, have like a solid way of, uh, being able to coach uh, a lot of these these people that they're promoting these programs and stuff to, uh, or if that is still like a formula that is being used a lot. I just don't follow a lot of these types of of characters anymore. Uh, but I did see that like Shreds is coming back with uh, what? Yeah, 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 yeah. I disagree with Sal. I think that it's it's getting worse. I think what you're experiencing is so maybe uh, gym trainers are have evolving, but I definitely think there's a case for that. There's more education. I mean, imagine. Uh, I just can't imagine 20 years ago trying to learn today would have been so much uh, nicer, right? So like we had to go buy national certifications or find right. a mentorship right, where, right. man, you could follow some really intelligent people on YouTube and podcasting and you could get a lot of good information. So I think the uh, the trainer uh, has more education at their tips of their fingers than they did before. But I think we have this new anomaly that we didn't have 20 years ago, which is a massive market centered around digital online trainers. Mm -hmm. And because there's so many people training online and one of the best ways to to garner attention in this space, you know, is TikTok, you know, yeah. is use your is reels, is to yeah. get people to 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 click on you the and do you. And because of that, I, unfortunately I think it, it is far worse today than it was just 20 years ago. I think ago. you're right with because TikTok has really taken over um, a lot of the views, and and um, it's almost like it's it's degraded whatever we saw previous to that uh, from Instagram with, with with the information. I feel like it's even worse in that 
uh, format. It's yeah. tough because if I think about it and I try to look at data, because it's hard because social media sometimes appears distorted. So you get in the fitness space and social media doesn't necessarily represent what's happening. Um, it's like in our, the fitness space has always been uh, a bit dysfunctional, right? It's mm -hmm. always kind of been that way. I mean, before it was magazines, now it's social media. But when you look at the data, um, eating disorders, body image issues de definitely is on the rise. It's on the rise with, uh, with young kids, especially girls, but boys now, uh, young men now are, are suffering. So, and they think that has to do with social media. Um, but I will say again, in the gyms, I'm seeing things in the gym that I never, and these are, these are like people in their forties, fifties, like regular people. Like I never would have seen before doing pretty good technique and, and, well, and working I think out that's, right. But, think but that's, that's again, just the one gym I'm going to. Well, through. not to mention, I think that speaks to the point I made, which is, you know, it's, uh, the consumer is, is smarter today. We have access to, I mean, you can now get online and Google some really solid information, uh, around exercise yeah. training. And, and so I just think that there, there's way more information that's readily available for the either average client or person, or even the trainer who's working in the gym. I just think, unfortunately that d does not outweigh the flood of online trainers now. Mm -hmm. And even more importantly, online trainers that have, you know, you know, garnered the attention of millions of people, you know, and yeah. I, I mean, yeah. even, and even take that as an example, like I can think of, think of, um, you know, 10 of our smartest fitness friends, right. That we would consider buddies or friends of ours. Uh, and they, uh, many of them don't even have a million followers, mm -hmm. but yet, like, I'm sure this girl probably has millions yeah. of people that are following. Yeah. So that one person yeah. is getting more dwarfs attention, all, yeah, the good dwarfs information. all the good friends of ours that we know that, yeah. you know, maybe have a hundred thousand followers. We're in a losing You're, battle. I it is. Still. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's tough. It's tough to decide. I know, sometimes I feel like that. Sometimes I feel, uh, hopeful. You know, what's interesting about this is. If you look at any success, cause here's what happens to the average person. They see somebody who looks really fit or an athlete that uh, is very successful or somebody who did very well in business. And they can, we can identify with the hard workout or the hard, you know, thing that they had to do. So like I'm watching this trainer train these people so hard. And I'm like, that's the key to the success. That's the hard part. It's actually not. It's the consistency over years and years and years and years. It's like the business person that succeeds with a business. It's not that they worked one 20 hour day and grinded their ass off. It's that they were consistent year in, year out, year in, year out. So it is true that success in any realm, especially fitness, uh, is is challenging and hard, but the challenging and hard part is not the intensity of the workout. If you, if you really look at the whole picture, the intensity of the workout is way down the, the scale. Really the hard part is the consistency. For sure. Have you been doing this week in, week out, year after year after year? So when we watch videos like that, when people watch that, they think that's why they're successful. These women look amazing because this woman is training and making them cry. No, that woman's worked out for 10 years mm -hmm. consistently. That played a larger role in her success in this workout you see on Instagram that looks like it's, you know, it's killing her. I mean, one of, one of the, the biggest things that ever helped me with uh, overcoming that or figuring that out for myself was being okay with uh, doing a workout that would be considered really subpar, you know? And I think many people would think almost a waste of time. You're not burning hardly any, like one exercise. <sighs> I, I now that's kind of the game that I I, I play with myself when I because I'm I'm sure you guys are the same way. Yep. Uh, there's many times I'm not motivated. I don't want to get it. I don't feel like getting it oh, yeah. done, or I don't have a lot of time. All the excuses are there, mm -hmm. right? And I'm like, oh, I'm and and I'm pretty fit. I don't. I could get away with missing this workout. And then I go, you know what? Like, yeah, fine. Don't don't do your full workout. Just go just go do three sets or five. Like I make yeah. a deal with myself to do is like. The best bare minimum. And I'm like, okay, that's like nothing. That's a joke. And many times what ends up happening is it ends up turning into a great workout. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes mm -hmm. it ends up being three or five sets. But those three to five sets and making that decision, such a better choice than to just ignore it completely. And just to, and, and what I noticed more than anything else is it's less about the five sets and the workout. It's more about the, the consistency and the behaviors totally. mm -hmm. that I'm building by being okay with, okay, I'm just going to at least go do this. I think, I think if people would switch that mindset and I know I can't be alone, right? I'm, I, I have the uh, just as much uh, information I think as the average. You're consumer. not going to have the best workout ever every time. That's impossible. Right. Yeah, That's it's unrealistic. It's, it's physiologically and physically impossible. You know, you're going to have some workouts that are great, some workouts that are not so great. Uh, but it's the consistency is the hard part. So if you look at someone's very successful in that, 
Yeah. It's because they were consistent. It's not necessarily because they work out so hard that they almost throw up or they're sore for five days. Yeah, here's another sort of terrible analogy, but I look at it more <laughs> as like appetizer. Like I do the same thing, but I'll, I'll do like, you know, 10, five, five to 10 minutes of something. It's just, I have to establish that for the day. I'm so much more likely to get a good workout in uh, following that. If I don't do that, then my body's just more likely to just, oh, okay, I'm just going to yeah. sit down that, and write it out. That's the other thing that I found with it is that, you know, even if the workout itself, because let, let's be honest, okay, three sets of, of bench rest is not going to change your your physique that much but aside not only does it help with just keeping the consistency not only does it sometimes turn into a bigger workout but then it also changes my mindset the rest of the day because i i did something in the positive direction that yeah. way right so now when i had this choice where i was like oh i could have this for dinner or that for dinner and one of them being a much better choice for my body than the other one i'm more likely to make the better choice because i also made a better choice with me exercising right so i just I find that there's so much more benefit than I think I ever realized to just accepting that I'm going to go in and, and do a few things, even if it's not super intense, even if it's not major, just getting a few ex a few uh, exercises. In. You know, when they do uh, polls on people who've been doing this for a long time, so people have been working out consistently, uh, you know, for like 10 years, and they ask them why, like, what is it that makes you do it? It's not makes me look buffed, makes me look ripped. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm strong or whatever. It's always a mental, a phys uh, psychological. Right. I feel it gets good. my head right. That's why I do it now. I don't mm -hmm. do it for the other reasons. The other reasons are great. I'm not going to say I don't like them, but now it's really for the the mental aspect of it. So I don't miss it, even if even if I don't feel physically like this morning. I didn't feel like working out at all. I had a rough night last night. I woke up. I was groggy. Mm -hmm. So I went to the gym and I went super easy. But why? Because it sets my mind straight. If I didn't do it and I came to work without doing it, it would have been much, <laughs> would have been much worse. Today's giveaway map symmetry. This is becoming one of our most popular programs. You can get it for free. Here's how you win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode on this channel. Turn on notifications and uh, subscribe to this channel. Do all those things. If we like your comment, your comment, and we say, hey, this is the best one, we'll notify you in the comment section. Okay, so we're gonna comment underneath your comment and say, hey, you won you get free access to map symmetry. Also, these are the final hours for the bundle sales this month. The skinny guy bundle, 50% off, ends in the next few hours. And the fit mom bundle also ends in the next few uh, hours. And that's also 50% off. So those sales end in the next few hours. If you get this in time, click on the link at the bottom, uh, uh, excuse me, click on the link at the top of the description below to get that 50% off discount. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Oh yeah. You know, speaking of, how much of an effect a little bit of movement can have on the body. There's this, I'm really trying hard to decipher this particular study because it's pretty mind blowing um, on some of these results. So they did a study on the body's metabolism and how it's affected by exercising one of the smallest muscles uh, in the body. Okay, so it's pretty wild. I'm gonna read to you what happened here. And um, so I'm talking about the soleus, very small, flat, uh, muscle that makes up part of the calf. So when you look at the calf, you have the gastrox, which are the big meaty part. And underneath that is called the soleus. You should it's have just, made us guess which muscle. I know. Yeah, that There's so weird. many smaller muscles. So that's why I said it real quick. So <laughs> yeah. if you think yeah, even smaller. Yeah, it's okay. But anyway, when this muscle is activated, and I'll tell you how they activated it. When this particular muscle is activated, it had a profound effect on blood glucose in the body. So check this out. The whole body effects from doing a specific exercise on the soleus this tiny little muscle was a 52% improvement in the excursion of blood glucose and 60% less insulin requirement over three hours. And this was after testing them with a glucose drink. Huh. Just the, the soleus. Wow. Now, you know what they're doing for this mm. exercise? People are literally, I'm not making this up, they're sitting in, uh, in a chair. Yeah. Tapping and, their feet? No, so. doing like a little, yeah, little, little, little calf raises. raises. Yeah. Just the smallest calf raise. Now you're thinking, how is this even possible? So I didn't know this about the soleus, but it's pretty remarkable. Apparently this muscle, the way it is, it's, it's I don't know, designed or evolved to have tremendous um, stamina and endurance. So it doesn't store a ton of glycogen like other muscles do, but it sucks glycogen or it sucks glucose out of the blood. And this is because this muscle is super active in walking. Mm -hmm. So walking, walking for hours, trekking, humans have the capability to out trek almost any animal. And part so of it- more on like the type two kind of fiber. Yeah, and yeah. part of it has to do with, there's, there's lots of reasons why, but one of them is the soleus muscle. It's just super, I mean, even, even the most unfit person, their soleus has tremendous endurance compared to any other muscle in their body. 
So they had these people do this like really easy, just no resistance or anything, just lifting their heels like this. And they saw these profound effects in blood glucose in the body. Is it partially because of how far the muscle is from the heart too? And so it's got to work a little bit harder. It's because these muscles- Like let's say I did this. No, it's because these muscles suck glucose out of the blood. So they're- Differently than other muscles I was going to say, so it's unique then. Yes, Mm. it's unique then. It makes up 1% of your body's musculature, but it it, it acts like you worked 15% or something like that from what I read- According to say, so I'm trying to trip. read. I'm trying to read through this and really understand it. But this is crazy. This is profound. Well, so is literally, because it, it gets more force demand in terms of like overall body weight, and that's like at the bottom. Uh, be, be, no, because of the way that it sucks glucose forces. out of the blood. It literally sucks glucose out of the blood rather than using glycogen, rather than using fuel like other muscles. It's literally affects blood glucose in a in a massive way in comparison to other muscles. So all huh. the fat people that skip calves, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm serious. Like how, many, like how many fat this. dudes you know like do calves? That's like a skinny guy exercise, right? You're, you're, if you're insecure about your calves, you're doing calves like crazy. But you're the big dude who's been walking around with an extra 100 pounds, you never do calves. Uh, yeah. I mean- Because calves are always being worked. They're always, that's, yeah. That's, that's, that's really- Under demand. Look at this. Of all, look at this. This is a quote from the, from the, uh, the, the study. All of the 600 muscles combined- normally contribute only about 15% of the whole body oxidative metabolism in the three hours after ingesting carbohydrate. Despite the fact that the soleus is only 1% the body weight, it is capable of raising its metabolic rate during these contractions to easily double, even sometimes triple the whole body carbohydrate oxidation. We are unaware of any existing or promising pharmaceutical that comes close to raising and sustaining whole body oxidative metabolism at this magnitude. I mean, this is crazy, and I know they're going to do more studies it's built on this. In, yeah, but I'm so I belong to these forums on Facebook what? and uh, like these, you know, these neurobiology, biology, fitness, health forums, and it's just flying because this this is profound. Yeah, it's and crazy. it's literally, literally, it could literally mean this: you're about to eat a meal, do like fifty, do a pump, do like yeah. fifty of these. What was the original hypothesis? Why did they even do this? Uh, that's a good question. I'm a like, su- what would drive a study like that? Like, I think they're, I don't know. I'm going to guess that they were probably trying to see, is there an easy seated exercise that could have an effect on uh, you know, blood glucose? Like we know that right. two minutes of walking after a meal has a big effect on, remember we, there was that other study yeah, that showed yeah. that? So it's like, you don't need a lot of activity to really affect your blood sugar. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe it was along those lines. Did I'm you, not sure. I, I can't remember if you, did you say the time, how long to do that? It didn't, or how, no, it didn't. No but time I, around. No, but I don't think they were doing it very long. So I'm, I'm looking more into this because it's freaking wild. And I'm watching, there's a whole video on it of, uh, uh, of this person doing it. And I'm like, are they on a machine? Like what's going on? Well, that's doing, what I should have done on the plane all day yesterday. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, Man, dude. I did it all wrong. How, was your, that. how this, was your trip, guy? Yeah, it was awesome, dude. I had so much fun. It was just a blast to, to be a freak. Is this the know? third year in a row? The second. Oh, it was only the second yeah. year. Wait, so what is we're, this? We're making it a thing. What's the name of this? It's called Furnace Fest. So it's in Alabama. Uh, it, it was like all these bands that we grew up with. They're all underground. Like for the most part, sometimes you bring in like one name band or like two uh, to draw in more people. Uh, but yeah, it was a whole lot of bands that, like probably nobody's heard of in here. But what's great is that I don't listen to music like in any other way where I can get exposed to like new music. And oh. so for me, it's always like, oh my God, I get introduced to a band I didn't even know existed. And that happened for me going out there. I found this band that was just like pff, mind blown, dude. They put on like the sickest show and it was literally two guys. It wasn't even like this big band or like this big sound, very big sound, I should say, but uh, it was very raw. It's like, you guys know like White Stripes? Yeah. 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 So they were like the evil White Stripes. Oh. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> they crushed it, man. I mean, it was just like so raw and like like loud and raucous. And uh, they, at this one point, I took a video. Uh, he had all these different like tracks, and so because now like they can track a lot of um, sounds and different. Um, uh, you know, delay pedals and different things on the mics. You can do a lot of interesting things. And so he was like messing around with all these things. And he had this one really weird, like antenna looking device. And it made these like, almost like one of those like Tesla things that like you put your hands around and it has like lightning. Oh, like a coil. Yeah. Yeah. So he had one of those set up and it's like, it makes this really high pitch kind of noise when you get closer and then away. And so this guy's drumming and then he's up there. It literally looks like a wizard. He has his hands over it. Like this is like, (laughs) to 
me, like describing this is like horrible, but <laughs> it was so <laughs> weird and wild and awesome. And it's like, you never would see so that anywhere. The genre of music is is rock. Yeah. Metal. They call it, what well, they call it noise rock, which is, well, is that a new. Yeah. It's like a new, new genre. Uh, no. But yeah, it was, it was fascinating to see what they did. Does this fall into the case? So one of the last times we talked about your, your music, you told me that there's like uh there's, their name's 86 or 68, by the way, there is uh wait, what? Their name 68. Oh, the, the band. name of the group. Yeah, okay, yeah. 68. Is there meaning behind that? I have no idea. There has to be, right? 68. Isn't that, isn't that six? It's like, uh, it's not 69. So you owe me one? Remember yeah. That? You owe me one? Yeah. Is, is that, that what it is? is? I, I have know. no idea. We'll have to ask them. <laughs> yeah, okay. Someday. So you, you, before you told me there's like, uh, are, are these the groups that are heavy into drugs and drinking or is this the other side? Remember, uh, I forgot. It's you, kind of both. Yeah. You're right. So there's, um, yeah, so there's a lot of those kind of hardcore bands that were like Was there a name? Edge. Was there a name? Straight Edge. Straight Edge. That's right. That's Straight Edge. So, yeah, so Bleeding Through was there and they weren't there last year. That's the one that Brendan Shapati. Shapati's in. Yeah. So, it was it was so <laughs> it was cool, man. Like we we actually went uh VIP this year and um so we were kind of like backstage a bit and then they went on and I saw him and and he jumped on stage and Dude, he's been he's been hitting the gym, man. He was looking yoked yeah. out there, shaved head and everything, and just was looking crushed. <laughs> I was crushing on him, dude. <laughs> <laughs> this is awkward. You went with your friends, right? Yeah, I went with my friends. So yeah. So, now hold on. Explain the crowd. So is it a bunch of 40, 50 year old dudes that used to love metal? Yes. Is it young? Okay. There's like barely any young people, and there was a lot less girls this time too. So, so instead like, of three, there's just like one. An old sausage fest, an wow. old wrinkled sausage. <laughs> now, fest. Wh wh why? What, what's your thoughts on that? Why? Why is it not? Why does it not have the younger generation? Is that falling out? Of um, well, you know I, what I think is they were trying to kind of. I think they tried to bring him in with the punk bands that we just didn't go watch because I wasn't into like Newfound Glory and you know, some of these other bands that they brought on the bill that I was just like, eh, mm. uh, not my thing. Uh, so maybe they were there for that, but like, it, I think it's just, they didn't grow up with these bands and it's like, you don't, it's kind of what I see with like the high school kids that I work with too. They just don't have the, the anger and the, <laughs> It's a different kind of energy. <laughs> you know just, what I mean? Like they're, just they're, not angry, to like, they're not angry enough. They're no, dysfunctional they're enough. in different they're, ways. Yeah, in totally different ways. Like they, yeah, they're dealing with it in another way. Yeah. So uh, walk, walk me, rap. walk me through what like a uh, pregame looks like for this. Do you guys, you know, push each other around a little bit? Do a line of cokes? <laughs> take some shots of tequila? Like yeah. headbutt each other? Like what do you guys do to like get ready for this? Yeah. So <laughs> they put, uh, put Ben Gay on their, coke, on their uh, joints. Yeah. <laughs> It's so <laughs> underwhelming. Put, yeah. <laughs> Put on their knee, their knee wrap. Stretch, yeah. Stretchy. Little Ben Gay, yeah. dude, around the elbows and uh, knees, you know, just to make sure. I swear, God, you got to like at least some of that. Yeah, I did a, I did a few stretches. Dude. Do some lie. mobility? Not a lot. I, well, because I, I was like, we're like, dude, we're not going to go as hard this year in the pits and, and all that. And that just went out Bullshit. the window. <laughs> Once Norma Jean went on, I was, I went like, went for you it. Wait, you went back? You went in the, in the, in the mosh pit? I went in the mosh year? pit. Yeah. We had VIP and everything. That's There's no fair, reason dude. for me to go in the mix with everybody. I, I did that specifically to try and, okay, we're just going to enjoy the music this time. Yeah. See, that's dangerous. I, I'm going to tell you what, not for you. It's dangerous for everyone else because for, if you were in a mosh pit with a bunch of 20 year olds, you would hurt a lot of them because you're an animal. Yeah. You're going to go in with a bunch of 40, 50-year-old dudes? Yeah. I feel bad for these yeah. poor guys. Well, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, there's the potential's there, but, like, it it's real respectful. It's like a weird, chaotic, Because you're all on the same team. Respectful thing. Like, you're all on you the just, same team. Yeah. We all like the music, right? So Yeah, you just have to kind of know that um, there's going to be arms and legs and things flying around, and you just kind of kind of have to Did keep you get a hit peripheral. At all? Yeah, a couple times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got one on on the top of my head, and it, they probably you know, broke like their an hand. elbow or something. Yeah, this, <laughs> can you? This guy jumped off stage and just douche like landed right on my head. I, I have I have very minimal mosh pit experience, but some. Yeah. Okay. And can you really? Can, I didn't know you were in a mosh pit. Before. No, I I had a I had a roommate who was heavy into like uh, Dropkick Murphys and like oh, a, yeah, like them. like punk, right? That's probably mm -hmm. considered punk, yeah, right? Yeah. So I I've, I've been to a few concerts with her. Um, but I, I always had a hard time knowing if, if like, uh, the people in the mosh, 
if they were really just vibing with the music and Mosh and having fun and that we were on the same team or there was someone in there that was kind of intentionally trying to, can you, yeah. can you feel that interview? Oh, yeah. Can you see like the guy who's just like, yeah, yeah. But that guy gets his ass kicked. He does. Everybody gangs we, up on him. Yeah. We attack him. Okay. So yeah. you, 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 you can see that and sense that right away. Yeah. It, you, and so it's, it's changed a lot and it's so funny to talk about this stuff because this is all like, you know, unwritten stuff that it's just like part of the code yeah. uh, when you go into these things and there's different, especially in a venue like this, you get different genres. Like, so you get the hardcore, you get the straight edgers, you get the um, circle pit you know, like fast kind of music. So like punk music, you get a lot of like circle pits. That's, yeah, that's what I've experienced. What's yeah. a circle pit? It's like a you get a circle pit, and then you just... You run, yeah, you basically, somebody like creates space and then everybody just starts kind of moving in a circle and then you just get like swept into it. Uh, you know, if you're on the outside, sounds, they just push you in and you just... ah, terrifying. Yeah, well, it's, <laughs> it's really not that bad. It's just like you're just running and like hitting people like, you know, like next to you. It's not that big a deal. Yeah. But uh, so that's one version. Then there's this other version with the hardcore. They do like... Um, I, I call it like slam dancing or like we, we call it like ninja pitting. Like, because you just all of a sudden they'll hit like some breakdown and you'll see uh, a group of guys just like punching the air and like doing these like spinning kicks like in place and they just like start thrashing and i made the mistake long time ago i was at like a, a hardcore show uh, that we opened up for and i'm just sitting there like watching like oh this is interesting and then one of those things just broke out and this kid was like ah, started punching through his arm back and it hit me right in the nose <laughs> broke my nose <laughs> i was like oh shit what was that and he's like felt so bad he like gave me his hat and everything but that's a whole nother thing like mm. the ninja pitting. So that was going on at once with the circle pit. And then you have the stage diving happening uh, as well. So there's lots of chaos. You got to kind of keep you your know, eyes out. I, I wonder if there's like studies done on, on this. Cause I feel like hmm. it's, it's fascinating to me. Um, I, I've studies never studies like what? Like, well, okay. So like why, that? what type so like, of, what type of men are drawn to no, this? No, not just that, but like, what's the, cause there's definitely a benefit, right? Cause what you're witnessing for my, this oh, is my an outlet, opinion. dude. Yes. So yeah. my opinion, watching something like that, I'm thinking this is unprocessed emotion and it's coming out and it's probably cathartic. I bet it feels really good. <laughs> sure. Right. To let it out. Yeah. And, and what's my evidence of that is that people are hitting each other. And for the most part, nobody gets into a fight. Yeah. Everybody's like, we're here together. Yeah. Letting this out. We're, and, we're pressing that line. And you also know? you're feeling a unity because uh -huh. it sounds to me like it self-organizes. Yeah. So I wonder if there's any study because totally that's is. fascinating to me. Yeah. And it's like somebody fell, you pick get, pick them right back up. And so it's not like, yeah, there's no malintention going in. It's usually the person that has no idea and is like, oh, what's happening? And then they try and like get all serious about it. And then, you know, we, we stomp them right away. So, so how many buddies <laughs> did you go with? Two other guys. Oh, that's it. So there's just three of you guys. Yeah, it's the three of us. And so my my old lead singer and and uh, uh, bassist, guitarist, and uh, yeah. So we, it's funny, dude. It, it for us, it's like, you know, we come back, we don't get to hang out ever, and it's 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 like rekindling kind of that that whole music side. Uh, so dude, it's so dorky, but we get get so inspired, we go back and we start playing, you know, and we jam together and stuff at this house that I got. So. Uh, one of my friends is doing kind of a side project that's so sick. He, he like, and I, I, I probably shouldn't talk about it yet, but like he does, he's doing like a themed kind of metal yeah. theme to like a very famous show. And then with like the characters going to dress up as them and everything. And so anyway, it's, I can't wait to, I'll, I'll show you guys now, once it's out. It's, as, as like the baller of the group of you three, do you get like less respect because of that? And do you like kind of downplay your success and shit like that? And cause I feel like that's like, it's <laughs> comes from grunge and like hardcore. Yeah, but they're way better blue musicians collar, than me, like, bro. Huh? <laughs> I said they're way better musicians. So it's like, they have that. Bro, these me. are all, all, these are all mature men with families. I'm sure there's a yeah. lot of successful people. You know, I, I mean, you just got to reach back and get you. That you, old. Per, you, per, you think a lot of like uh, you know lawyers and suit up, suited up guys that I, I get, get out just, of work and then they throw I, their <laughs> their gauges in and then they freaking go out and smash each other. Well, you're probably yeah. getting maybe. I would I would I would bet it like eighty to ninety percent is probably blue collar would be my guess, and I would think that that yeah. kind of like 
grunge or like vibe is more respected than somebody who like works for the man and it makes all kinds of money and shit. Wouldn't you, or no, I mean, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just guessing right know. now. Yeah. It, it, it's kind of an eclectic bunch. I and mean, would it be weird it, for someone like friends, you to yeah. go super VIP and posh guys stay at the oh, four yeah. seasons yeah, and then yeah. you go to the freaking, you know, rage concert. Like, is that, is that <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. That's <laughs> getting massages afterwards. That's not what so. it's about. <laughs> that's not what it's about at all. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's a totally probably more on the, the blue, collar vibe for sure uh because it's it's a rough you know it's a rough outlet like like you're saying like we're there to like it's like some kind of catharsis you know we're well i was just i was joking earlier because when you're doing it when you're a teenager you're like mad because you know mom and dad don't understand you school sucks Mm -hmm. i don't get that girl broke up with me yeah but then when you're like in your 40s and 50s are they like my wife Complains, you know, yeah. my kids, ah, I can't create a relationship uh, with my son. Yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah. Fuck, you know, uh, yeah, I have to go to work every day, you know. Exactly, kind of <laughs> yeah, r- raging about, uh, yeah, like like world politics and, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> COVID, ah. I love yeah. it. No, uh, yeah, so anyway, so yeah, we, the, the biggest, like, thing for me, though, that was tough was, was the food situation because, um, you know, like, uh, I guess it's, there's just a disconnect there in, in terms of like, I don't know if you guys have different friend groups that like, like certain types of food, like restaurants and then prefer things over the other. They, they preferred a lot of like fast food restaurants. Yeah. And like, I just haven't been in that mentality for a really long time. Yeah, The most fast food I'll do is like in and out. That's yeah. about as far as I'll go. Yeah. But I won't do like McDonald's, Burger King, Taco Bell. Like five guys is probably as far but, yeah. as I've gone, you know, in, in, in a long time. And so, uh, there was nothing open after the show and like, dude, we burned all kinds of calories out there and we're just starving and, and it's like, dude, Oh, this is open. And it's Taco Bell. I'm like, Oh, Taco Bell. Uh-oh. I was like, Oh hell no. This is, I already was like, dude, this is going to be like the worst idea we've ever had. Like, I don't know what you guys are talking about. Oh, you're going to be fine, dude. It's just tacos, you know, just tacos. And so we went back and I, dude, I haven't had Taco Bell in probably in over a decade. Like I'm, I'm not going to How lie. fast did you get diarrhea? Like how Yeah, I thought it was going to be okay because it's not like a greasy, you know, like crazy burger or anything from McDonald's. Like, I thought it might be okay, but dude, it was probably within an hour. I was just like, my stomach just was like this. And then I was on, <laughs> it was just like coming out, it was coming out. Oh my God, everywhere. Yeah, oh. I don't know. Like, and, and I was like pissed off about them. Like, why can't I just handle something simple like that? It just was like an immediate response. Oh, oh it was brutal. I dude. remember I used to be able to eat that, dude. Yeah. As a kid. All the time, too. Yeah. I can't even. Like, there's it wasn't no a thing. Way. There's yeah. no way one item from there would just shred me up. <sighs> and Terrible. it was good, too. I was so hungry. I was like smashing them down. So anyway, did, did so you the, bring anything of ours? Did you bring I, any, any of our partners and stuff like that? The stuff? I did actually this time around because last year, like we kind of ran into some similar problems. And so I, I brought a bunch of like the green juice packets with me this time. Oh, there you go. And, yeah. So I, I was like passing them to them too the next morning because we were all just like it, stomachs and knots. And, oh. You know, I needed something to kind of bring me back Ooh. to nutrient uh, levels. Yeah, so. I'll do. Um, if I do, if I do something, I, I haven't done Taco Bell, but if I know I'm gonna go ham like that, I'll go. I'll bring the Organifi green juice, and then if it gets real bad, I'll do activated charcoal. Yeah, just to absorb whatever. The oh, hell that's is yeah, that going on. Inside. That's right. But the green juice makes a that. big difference. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's weird well, though, right? It's weird it how help. you used to be able to eat that kind of yeah. stuff. I don't get it. What was the favorite part of the trip? Um. I want to say, I mean, just catching up with them. Like we just had, we, we, you know, reminiscing and whatnot. These guys go back to high school. Is that how far back you guys go? College. Oh, college. College. Yeah. So we, I mean, we, we really thought we were going to like tour and do all these things like as a band and stuff. And, and uh, it was just fun to, to go back through all the stories of like all the dumb things that, yeah, <laughs> we, all the dumb ideas we had and like, like how misguided our efforts were. Uh, you know, trying trying to become like a a band, a big thing. Um, but yeah, we were just you know shooting the shit, and I had this place that had like a pool and stuff, so we we're just hanging out there. But um, I mean, I don't know. The whole trip for me was just great. It was uh, sixty eight though. I just dude, I can't get them. Their, it was their performance uh, Alabama. Mm-hmm. That's what what part again of Alabama? Birmingham. Oh, Birmingham. Oh, yeah. Okay, oh, cool. Good deal. Yeah, cool. So you went to um, Sanctuary, yeah, just for one night. Oh yeah. Yeah, it was like the last uh you know, 
time we're going to go anywhere before the baby, I guess. So I said, let's book something. Let's do something before the, you know, the shit hits. The and scene, kidless too. Yeah. Yeah. Mom watched the little one. So uh, just Jessica and I, how was that? Wow. It was fun. We just hung out. She's now late in the pregnancy. So she's, I think we're like five weeks away. That's crazy. Wow. It's here already. Dude. I know, man. I know. Literally. Um, so we so didn't fast. do a ton, but we went, uh, we it's went and some, yeah, we went to Carmel. Um, had a good lunch, just hung out, just the two of us, and just had that last, <laughs> like, it's like, we're not going to do this for a long time, so let's do this one more time yeah, yeah, yeah. before everything. Do you guys remember first realizing uh, that you can't eat garbage like you could before? Do you remember the first time that happened to you? Because I have a distinct memory of it for myself. Yeah, I think it was actually a Taco Bell story for me. Was it? it? Was, oh, yeah, it was my late 20s. It was late That's right around there, right? Yeah. Late 20s, early 30s. Well, because honestly, my early 20s, I was a trainer and still eating fast food. Um, same. Yeah. I, I used to, you know, <laughs> terrible, but I used to like, you used to base it off how you look. That's yeah. Crazy. And I, and oh, I used lean. to, and I used yeah. to promote to my clients like, Oh, you know, if you get in shape and we build this muscle, you, you could eat this way too. <laughs> you yeah. know, that was fucking stupid. No, other, no negative effects. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, terrible. Right. Yeah. I, admittedly it was terrible. So yeah, I think I was that way for, uh, all the way until my mid towards my late twenties. And then I, it was really after, I think it was about after, Oh, a year of like consistently getting out that out of my life, like just completely like getting rid of it and then reintroducing it on a, on a day and thinking that like, Oh, it's been over a year since I've had this. Let me try it. And I think I probably did that two or three times in my late twenties. And then about the, probably the third time of just like, like oh, okay. and I'm even faster. Like I won't even be able to finish the food and I'll have to go, I'll have to be on the toilet. Like that's how quick, uh, my body will tell me Fast if I, metabolism. I, it's, it's that quick. I mean, I, I had this, uh, I ordered some food this weekend actually off uh, that uh, out of the ordinary is a place called Butterhouse. It looks amazing, but just, you know, it was done really greasy and uh, I didn't even get, you know, five bites into it. And it's like, See, I that's how quick it, it, it responds now. For me, it was right me. around the same age. Yeah. I think it was in my late twenties. I was hanging out with one of my clients and um, I was, we, he was like, dude, he's like, I, I need help with my, my diet, you know, go through my cupboard, take everything out that isn't good. And I was teasing him because I went through his cupboard and he had Captain Crunch cereal. So I'm like, I'm going to eat the rest of this Captain Crunch so you don't need it, right? And I hadn't had that kind of cereal in a long time. It was my late 20s. And I remember I ate the bowl and then my stomach kind of hurt. And I was like, oh, well, whatever. Anyway, the next day was not a good situation to the point where I went to the doctor. Oh my God. Yeah. And the doctor checked me and he goes, yeah, dude, you just... It just really messed up your gut. And he goes, I don't think you should be eating Captain Crunch. And I'm like, look at that. I'm like, I'm an adult. You know, I'm like 29. Yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> I can't be. I should be eating Captain Crunch cereal yeah, at my age. What the hell is wrong with me? <laughs> anyway. I mean, I think it's kind of a, a blessing in disguise. I think it, one of the hardest things for people that don't, and, and before I had that feeling is, because the body is so resilient, it does adapt and get used to that. I mean, I imagine... If one of us were to continue to push that and just say, I have nothing else to survive on but Taco Bell and you sure. ate Taco eventually the body would probably self-regulate a little bit and you would probably be able to handle it, which I don't think that's a, you know, I don't think it's an ideal situation. I think it's so eye-opening that, wow, just by simply clearing this out of my system and then when I reintroduce it, look at how upset my stomach feels. That's why I love like the whole, you know, when you fast for an extended period of time and then you slowly reintroduce foods, it's at that window for the next like week or two is really eye opening on like how your body accepts certain foods. Mm -hmm. Because if you eat something really healthy and balanced and nutritious and it's like, like having a high performance car, putting low, oct a low octane gas. Oh, yeah. here we go. Some 87. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. Oh shit. This Ferrari sounds like crap. What the hell's going on? Right. Yeah. Right. And, and you're you just hyper aware at that point. Yeah. I think, yeah right? I think so. Speaking of food, um, so, uh, Jessica was asking me about butcher boxes, salmon. So my son Aurelius, we try, we're, we, we kind of dealing with these gut issues with him. And part of what we're doing is we're putting him on a low histamine diet. This was, um, you know, re uh, recommended to us by our functional medicine, um, you know, friend and Becky Campbell, Be Dr. Becky Campbell. And, um, so she asked me, she goes, does butcher box flash freeze their salmon? I don't know the, the big difference between regular Frozen never, salmon never or flash frozen? I have no idea. So flash freezing salmon or fish, it doesn't develop ice crystals in the meat. It preserves the nutrients. And it's actually, when you, when you so cook it- they vacuum it, seal it right away? They vacuum it, seal yeah. it and they freeze it super fast. Yeah. Like super, super cold air and freeze it super fast. It's called flash freezing. Okay. And it preserves the meat and it preserves the, the freshness. So once it thaws and you cook it, it's like you're eating it right then and there. Mm -hmm. And I was reading articles on this. It's better than buying- quote unquote, fresh salmon, unless you're getting salmon right off the boat, what? 
Fresh salmon is usually thawed frozen salmon. So they'll catch the salmon, they'll freeze it, then they'll thaw it, then they'll sell it to you at the grocery store. It's actually better to get something that's flash frozen. Because they freeze it right at the moment when it's they they catch it and it's processed. Now, what's interesting to me is why that is not uh, more well known and people don't use that as a marketing tool. I it mean, I is would, apparently a marketing tool. So ButcherBox, I went on their website and everything. Like, oh, Flash Frozen. I'm like, okay, I didn't know about this. Oh wow! Mm. But it preserves it. There's no ice crystals. The flavor is good. It's good. It's better for you. And then because we're doing this low histamine diet with my son, it it creates less of the byproducts that you would get from slow freezing, which is more histamine. So, and that's for, for people who are sensitive. That's a, what's the thing. closest like fish you guys have ever had to like, like fresh out the boat. Like have you, can you, can you think of an experience where you've actually experienced something like that, where you think it's like the freshest you've like ever had a restaurant that you yeah, had yeah, a restaurant or even, I don't know if you've ever gone fishing and then cooked oh, it right oh, up yeah. right afterwards. Well, have you ever had something the best, like that? The best time I did that was when we went to boundary waters and um, it's right there on the border of like Canada and, and Minnesota. And you, you have these, canoes and you bring gear so we actually fished like right off the canoe and uh we caught some some trout and then took it to the shore and we had like a little uh, iron skillet and some butter and salt and whatnot and literally just flayed it gutted it and then just threw it on there right away and ate it like right away that was the best fish I've makes ever had. a difference See, yeah I, it makes a, a massive difference yep. so my best experience like that was in alaska and i wish i remember oh, that was it. recently right when you not recently well, like yeah, a few years ago yeah yeah not that long ago right so let less than 10 years ago it was uh katrina and i did a trip to alaska and we did it the cruise and we went into all these ports i wish i remember exactly what port it was but we went into this port and you know you get off the boat and you don't even walk 50 yards and I, I think it was like Joe's Crab Shack or something. I can't remember the name of it. But you you sit in it, and the back of the the kitchen is like this, got this big open window. And you literally watch the fishing boats come in and then wheeling these carts of moving crabs from the boat to it. And then the guy grabs them and then throws them in the pot right there. And then Dude. they're then they're right into you. You're eating them. Is it right. the association? Because you see them I, you know, alive and then... That's why I'm asking you guys because I'm wondering difference. if it's like the association or there's probably... I mean, no, it makes a difference. It was the most amazing crab I'd ever had in my life. I mean, like it's yeah. not even close like the next best... You know, example of crab when that I've freeze, had, and I want it's like that. It doesn't get any fresher than that. Yeah, if you freeze Bob like in Chicago, if oh Amazing. really? Yeah. So if you if you traditionally freeze something, ice crystals form in the meat, and it changes the flavor of it. The meat degrades a little bit. There's certain compounds that are produced, so it can change the flavor. Um, and this is just from what I read over the weekend, for because I was like I said, I was researching for the for butcher box. I went. I was in Belize, and we did this little trip where a guy took us on this boat. To this tiny island, but on the way there, there was a buoy, and and the buoy was it was sh it showed him where there was like a little lobster trap. So he said, "Let me see if we caught anything." He goes down, and they caught a couple, and then he put them on the boat, and we went to this little island. He cooked them right there, and it was amazing. It's amazing, Sweet, right? it was amazing. It yeah. tastes so good. And I'm not a huge seafood person. Yeah, Made a big difference. I'm not at all, but I love it like that. Yeah, it was really good. Wasn't that you know speaking of seafood? Wasn't that what um, Michael Trinau told us about uh, the whole seafood? game yeah mm -hmm. wasn't that fascinating i know i had never heard that before i just that it makes like sense the whole you know tuna salmon swordfish thing is like a whole marketing game yeah there's like, all there's, these other local there's like fish thousands nobody... of different like mm -hmm. types of fishes that are amazing yeah, local fish that just don't get any yeah. marketing play so yeah. i thought that was such a brilliant idea when he came up with that and i had i never knew that i just assumed that we eat the best fish because mm -hmm. it's the best fish not because it's got a bunch of marketing money speaking of it. marketing and money all that stuff i want to hear what you because you told me earlier that um i guess chamath on all in was talking about something about the markets or something's going on well did you see that he he pulled out um so he's like you know uh, known as like the big spac guy right and he i mean he was he took helped um well what's his name richard branson's company uh you know public through his oh yeah i did hear this they yeah. took all they, they gave all the money back to investors gave, yeah gave their money back because they can't and find I don't, I, good so picks. i'm not i'm i'm, I'm not uh, familiar wow. with how often that happens i didn't even know that was a thing apparently it wasn't just him there's other the, yeah a lot of people are following following his lead i believe and starting to like so you have all these th so he runs a massive fund right and i think how he's he's collected i mean uh, hundreds of millions so of dollars let me get this straight adam because uh, i'm not quite sure how this works they collect money from investors yes. smaller amounts right. so that they could have a large fund and then they go and, they, and they're and entrusted they go find to make. That's right. They go make them. They go find the company. So you give them the money and you say, okay, I trust you to go make some good picks. Yes. And then they, he came back and said, there are none. Yeah. I'm giving everybody your money Here's back. Here's your money back. And he loses tens of millions of dollars doing that. 
because just to it was just, billions of dollars. Just, right? Yeah, just to draw up the contracts. Wow, they must just, be really seeing <laughs> things that the average. Yeah, I mean, I read an article that he said that like it's over the the era of spacs. It like he's saying that. What it's, does that stand for? Uh, Doug, help me because I don't know the acronym off the top of my head. It's the SPAC. S P A C. Yeah, yeah and I, mean, I was looking it up. Let me okay. That yeah, he us. says that the he, that we had been in a bubble for the last decade, and that it's just not not going to happen anymore. Well, check this out. So the S and P five hundred. I sent this to to you guys in the group text. Is down twenty three point three percent in the first one hundred eighty four trading days of twenty twenty two. The fourth worst start in history. So this is the fourth worst start of a year in history. And then. Um, uh, a buddy of mine who's really big into investments and stuff said basically this the everything bubble is going to pop soon. So mm. everything because I wish there's nowhere safe. I wish I could remember what episode and Andrew would you'd be a champ if you actually found this, but I know I said it almost a year ago. My personal prediction is 2022 is when we're going to start to see the dip. That October of 2022 would would tell us everything. And I th I swear that this is we're like less than a week away from that and every, I mean, they're already after you saw the Fed came out and did another 75 basis points, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So they did that previously, which is already like we, we broke that was the first time ever we had three times in oh, a row, yeah. 75 basis points. But the time, here's what's what, what, why it was such bad news and why we're seeing what we're seeing right now from this time is last time it was like speculation if it was going to be 50 or 75 basis points. And they said if they went 75 basis points, then we should see inflation start to curb and we're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. This time, not only do they go 75 basis points, but now they're saying at least another 150 plus is coming next. And because they they it's inflation is not slowing down. And so this is also why, to wow. your point about the market, this is why that is correcting so hard right now. And next is to see the the real estate to follow. It's going to get, there's some people that are speculating it's going to be worse than 08 now. Yep. Wow. And I would have said no way. And it doesn't, and you would think that, okay, this can't be possible because there's not these subprime loans that are floating around and stuff like that. But we got, we got inflated so fast, so hard that well I th the, the the rate is so different now for like buying a house for example yeah that your monthly payment i don't remember there was i sent it to you guys but it was something it's like, almost double so it went from somebody who wanted if yeah i've seen i actually saw patrick but david posted also he said that, that luxury housing's already dropped 28 percent yeah in comparison to where it was yeah. at the middle and you, so now the people will argue that like okay well we've been on this climb of 20 to 30 percent a year and so 20 percent correction is really just bringing it back down to flat line so it's not as like scary it's that if it continues yeah. down that that path that we might see one of the biggest corrections ever but you're right okay so most people and i think this the stats on it are like 85 or 90 percent very high m buy houses based off of their their payment yeah people don't most they people don't, don't buy people don't go like oh i can afford a house that's this expensive for the next 30 years they go like i can afford this payment therefore whatever i can be unless you for. buy the house cash so you have right. to do that and the example that you were showing was that just last year this exact same time interest rates for a 30-year mortgage is around a 2.9 and now it's all the way it's you know six. we're creeping up to six and so what that looks like is somebody who uh bought a half a million dollar house just last year would have the same payment as someone buying like a $250,000 house yeah. today. That's how that's, how, and obviously that gets crazier, more egregious as you go higher in the the, the price point. So, which is why luxury yeah. homes are probably going to get crushed. I mean, you're going to see, I think everything's going to get crushed. I don't think there's going to be, I mean, obviously there's outliers that didn't climb that much that won't be, but I definitely think that, um, you know, it's here. And the inflation, I think we have a minimum of 12 to 18 months. Weren't they already saying waters. something like, um, basically, it's going to be great when we get inflation down to four or five percent, Yeah, which 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 is like before it was two percent was the mm -hmm. target. Mm -hmm. And I remember my, my buddy told me that he goes, oh, what they're going to do is they're going to change basically what's considered acceptable inflation. They're going to say now, no, four or five percent is good, which is double what we used what to consider used to OK right. just a few years ago. Yeah. So well, the real scary part is also like what kind of knee jerk reaction is you know government going to do to try and respond to this? That's what I'm scared of. Because then when everybody gets all fearful uh, of this and everybody overextended themselves in the last couple of years, everybody's going to have their hand out and be crying like, "Oh my God!" Especially when unemployment starts to go up. And so then, and then we're coming into we'll be coming into an election year in the next twelve to eighteen months, mm -hmm. and they'll be talking about getting reelected, and then. You know, the last thing that we want to see is a president trying to get reelected by giving free pizza just to get people to vote. And because that will just 
well, that's what's exacerbate happen. the problem even further than what it gonna, yeah. already. And so it's crazy to think that it's getting nasty right now and it potentially could get way, way worse. So I don't know what to, I know. I mean, I, the, the move was to, to hang tight. I mean, to hold tight and to, um, to save, to stack your we chips right now. We have to right feel now. pain. At some, yeah. We have to. They'll just deflect and, and, you know, bring up all the other talking points of, of whatever else, you know, that's out there that people get emotional about. Well, it's going to be a lot of finger pointing. This guy, that guy, this yep. party, that party. The reality is uh, that everybody was working together. This has been a, a ten-year process. It's been a decade. Both sides are guilty of plus yeah, in the word inflating this so. special special purpose acquisition company. So it's basically yeah. to help companies go private companies go public. Is the idea? That's mm -hmm. what the whole Richard Brant like. So he took Richard Branson's. Uh, um, what's his, yeah. his space company? I forget it's what it's, it says. It's a company Virgin without Virgin, commercial Virgin, operations Virgin. and is formed strictly to raise capital through an initial public offering or the purpose of acquiring or merging with it. Yeah. And he, they literally gave back that's all spack. the money. That's Just spack. So the audience wow. remind, yeah. Yeah. remembers that's a, what that's we're talking spack. about. Yeah. He, right. gave, he gave back billions of dollars and literally took it on the chin himself, losing uh, tens of millions of dollars. Cause just to set all those deals up, Yep, and to get so that's not a canary in a coal mine, you know. Oof. I don't know what it is. Oh yeah, and you know, I was watching their episode this morning, and he was they were referring back to clips that he said like over a year ago, and you know, one of the biggest things that he says was the the indicator for him that he said a year ago, and obviously it's coming true now, is that when you see people like the Elon Musk, the Bill Gates, you know, these these big billionaires yeah. super know, smart investors yeah, yeah selling exactly. off yeah. some of their 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 most prized you know assets and stocks that they love so much you know and they they tout all the time and they're and they're selling massive positions on things that they believe are going to be around for a long time it kind of tells you they're taking some cash off the table because mm -hmm. they see the writing on the wall and you know to to not do it yourself or not think that way yourself or think that this ride's going to continue that way is a bit arrogant right yeah. to think that you're smarter than mm -hmm. all all of these guys that it's not going to get dark pretty soon here check this out there's a lot of companies out there that sell vitamins and minerals and supplements but the problem is your body doesn't really absorb them really well well there's a company called live on labs that uses pharmaceutical grade technology liposomal delivery technology that makes sure your body absorbs these nutrients so you don't just have expensive urine you take a product and it gets to the target tissues. And right now you can get lipoglutathione for free when you bundle it with B vitamin complex and vitamin C if you go through our link. So go to liveonlabs, L-I-V-O-N labs.com forward slash MP to get hooked up. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Andrew from California. Andrew, what's happening, man? How can we help you? How's it going, guys? Good. Um so I have been lifting for probably four or five years now. Um, started through football. I actually went to the high school that Justin now coaches at. Really? Um, and I did not find you guys through that. I found you guys separately and then connected the dots afterwards, oh, wow. which was bizarre. But Right on, Philip uh, Cougar. Is there a picture of uh, Justin in the, in the weight room there? Um. I'm not sure. Or or is, oh, there or, is, buddy. Or his phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Immortalized. Or his phone number in I the mean. bathroom stalls <laughs> for a good time. <laughs> well, you know, people people enjoy me. Yeah. Sorry, Andrew. Go yeah, ahead. Go continue. Ahead. No, you're good. Um, so after my junior year, halfway through was when COVID started. <clears throat> and so lifting kind of took a pause for a little bit and then came back uh, through a friend of mine, he had a home gym that we all went to. Um, and, and that's really when I dove into it. And I found you guys about a year after that. But I was going to school and I met at the gym I was going there. I met a bunch of powerlifters and they really indoctrinated me. And so... I signed up for my first powerlifting competition and then leading into it, I hired a coach and he's a super knowledgeable guy, knows how to phase the training to kind of stimulate hypertrophy for a while and then switch into a strength block and then peak for a meet. Super knowledgeable and I've learned a bunch from him as far as form and technique. But now I'm going into my second powerlifting competition and the question that I have 
Um, about a month and a half ago, I suffered an AC joint sprain and didn't know what it was at first. Did a bunch of things. I used Maps Prime trying to figure out what was going on. Couldn't figure it out. Eventually, talking to my coach, just decided I need to go to a physical therapist because it wasn't an imbalance or anything. She uh, works out of the gym that I work at now and helped me figure out it was an AC joint sprain, give me a bunch of stability stuff to do. But now that I'm leading into my second competition that I've been preparing for like six months for it and don't quite know how to bench with an AC joint sprain, we've been basically staying pain-free and that's my max all time is 275 and I haven't been able to go over 185 without having pain. Uh, my coach, like he's super knowledgeable, knows a bunch, but doesn't have much to say other than we got to stay pain free. We tried some technique things, couldn't get that. Um, so right now our plan is just two weeks out to kind of just see what I can do as far as singles and then just try to replicate that on meet day. Uh, just sucks because it's been like six months preparing for this and don't quite know <clears throat> what to do. Yeah, no. Okay. So, um, AC joint issues are relatively common. Close uh, to home for you. Yeah. Yeah. I had an, I had AC joint separation. So yours wasn't separated, right? It was just a sprain. It was a sprain. Yeah. No okay. tears, no separation. All right, that's good. That's very good because it can get better. Mine separated. So a, the AC joint, a, a chromioclavicular joint, it's at the it's where the collarbone, kind of the end of the collarbone here at the top of the shoulder. And there's a lot of stress being placed on it um, in horizontal type pressing. Believe it or not, overhead pressing tends to not bother it. Incline pressing tends to not bother it. Uh, dips, like body weight dips and bench press and decline type stuff will probably bother it most. You know, here's the deal. I, I know it sucks because you're preparing for this meet. Um, but my suggestion is to is to wait until it's fully healed, which may mean in this situation, you avoid bench press for a while. So we're not talking about, you know, um, it's, you know, unstable and that's why the, the it's sprained, meaning there's an injury there. You got to wait. Is it, it's how, what are, what are some of the most common reasons why someone sprains that the inability maybe to pack the joint and stay stable there? Is that normally why someone sprains the AC joint? You know, it's, there's such an emphasis in powerlifting with the bench press that you start to develop imbalances, uh, with your pressing and the arch of the bench and the way you're positioning yourself. That AC joint is just placed in a lot of, with all that volume, it's just placed under a lot of um, a lot of stress. Now, I didn't do mine benching. I did mine because I placed my arm back in jujitsu and Ooh. hit the ground real hard. And so you'll see AC joint uh, separations like football and, and sports like that. Um, but power lifters often will get pain in the AC joint and you got to lay off the bench for a while. Now, what you can do is you could do incline presses, incline dumbbell presses. You could do overhead presses, which will maintain some of your bench strength. But I would avoid competing in the bench press until you're like 100%. And, and you're young, and I know this is like exciting and you're competing, but what you don't want to do is get to the point where you have to have it get resected because then you'll never get 100% of the stability you can have in your shoulder. So like the left, my left shoulder, I have, the, I have the AC joint was resected. Now I've got it back to like 90% of its original stability, but I'll never get back to 100% because yeah, and now that joint's at, gone. Look how buff Sal is and he has a bench with 135 all yeah. the time. <laughs> all the time. That's his max. In one hand though. Yeah. So uh, no, but no, you know, all joking aside, you're going to probably have to avoid benching for a while. So I would suggest if you want to continue to compete, maybe you compete in a single exercise meet, you know, like a deadlift or a squat. Sometimes they have those. Or just just chalk it up, yeah, go to the meet, work your way back, do a do a real light bench, and then just look and see how heavy you can squat and deadlift. And your total is not going to be great because your bench is going to be so low. But so what? You're still learning the skill. You're still competing. You're still part of the of powerlifting. But you got to wait for it to heal, man. Because if you keep benching through this process, you may not it, you may prevent it from really getting a hundred percent. And um, I know what it feels like. Like I said, to be on the other end of that, you don't want to get to the point where and that's what I did. I ignored it. I, I ignored it and I kept working over it and working around it and pushing and pushing. And then it became a full separation. So I think, I think, uh, I think you're not going to like anybody's answer, Andrew. Yeah. I think we're, we're all going to probably tell you something really similar. I think the best advice, Sal, uh, to, 
to kind of like coming from an athletic background, I, I know how shitty that is. You're, you've been training for something. Yeah. You're excited. You're seeing mm -hmm. progress in your lifts. Like you're feeling pretty good. Then you have this injury and it's like, ah, that competitive side of you still wants to compete. So I, I think the advice that you just gave is probably the best advice where I still feel like I could go compete, even though I probably know I'm going to take an L because I'm, I'm not going to be able to put up a good bench number, but I would still go through the process and I would just accept that. I would just say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to keep training. I'm going to lay off the bench. I'm going to, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to bench a number that is so much lower than my max uh, just to get in there and, and to be able to compete. And I'm really focused on my deadlift and my squat going, going into this meet and then letting my, uh, my AC joint heal. So that's probably the best advice um, that I think all of us are probably going to give. I don't think, unless Justin, you have something different. No, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where, um, yeah, as an athlete, you're, you're trying to overcome everything. So this is like, you know, another one of those things you look at is adversity where you have to kind of push through. But uh, when it comes to like something you could end up preventing you from competing further, like this is like a more of a conversation of like, what is your future look like in terms of competition and you know how serious are you going to take this or is this just the experience that you're wanting to get out of it then i would say what you know they're talking about in terms of still going through the process of competing and um you know like doing it at a very minimal weight in terms of it uh you know affecting and, and hurting you know what you already have going on uh, i mean i would pretty much just solely focus on rebuilding yourself and, and getting your, your your body back to optimal uh, form and and that's tough to hear. Yeah, so. and I know Andrew, you, you, the way you feel, you're super uh, focused and motivated, and it feels like, man, this is awesome. I don't want to. I've been preparing for this. I don't want to avoid it. I don't want to have wasted all that time. But if you take a if you take a couple steps back, focus completely on rehabbing, um, and still do the other exercises, and you can still train. Like I said, I, I, I'm assuming like you probably feel okay with an incline press, right? It probably doesn't bother it. Yeah, it's only at like the very top if I'm fully locked out above that it does, but the entire range of motion feels fine. Yes. So I've been doing a bunch of incline without fully locking out at the top. Okay, so I mean, you could still work out those muscles, you but really focus on rehab. So you take a couple steps back. What is that going to allow you to do though? It'll allow you to compete later on in the future. Right. Now, if you're like a professional athlete and this is the Super Bowl and you got a sprained AC joint, and that's your job. Well, okay, take some anti-inflammatories, put some tape on, and then go for it. And you're sacrificing your body. You're making a million, you know, millions of dollars. I could see that. But you're a young kid. I know it feels super important to you right now, but uh, it's it's probably not worth it. So I would focus entirely on rehab, train the rest of the body, and allow yourself to compete. You know, later you got on. a lot of time left. Yeah, to yeah. really come back with 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 some thunder. So it's it's all about like how much effort you put into it right now. That's going to help rebuild you back and and get you further than you would have got. Yeah, the weaknesses of powerlifting are its uh, its strengths. Its strengths are it focuses on these big movements, these really effective movements. You get strong at them. You build good muscle. But the weakness is it's it's three movements. And there are other things you could train around, but it really just competes in three movements. And so you tend to see issues, similar issues across the board with people um, with those types of sports. And injuries in powerlifting over time are, are pretty high, mainly because it's a, it's it's comp like any sport, right? You're competing at a high level. So if you want to be able to do this in the future, focus entirely on rehab. I would go to that. Physical therapy is the best thing you could do. Physical therapists are the best when it comes to stuff like this. They're better than any coach you're going to work with or anything like that. I would work with the physical therapist and wait till you're hundred percent before you really push it. Okay. Um, second part of the question, as far as my coach does my programming currently and, uh, I want to kind of switch towards more unilateral training. Like you guys have been talking about with map symmetry. Um, how would you on like, a you're all experienced coaches, if you had a client who wanted to kind of switch things up, how would you most want them to come approach you with something like that? Like I want to talk to him about running map symmetry oh, or run, switching up towards that. Does he listen to the show? He's not. Oh, good luck. And he now he's he's a, he's a powerlifting coach, right? Yes. Um, he so I met him as a friend first, and then he coached three or four people. And he coaches himself. He actually has a couple USAPO national records, so he's yeah, yeah, good luck. I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. So I would. Um, so I would not 
give you advice that would counter what he's saying in terms of powerlifting. He's he's going to be a better powerlifting coach than me. Not to mention he's got you right in person. I mean, we would yeah. all agree that that's a better a better coach than even us, right? Yeah, so. over here, you know, uh, through podcast or whatever. I mean, you could run but, symmetry. You could run symmetry by yourself. That's what I would do. I yeah. would I would finish the to the meet with him afterwards. Take a break for a while from him. Run symmetry by yourself since all of the coaching and stuff that we have in there. And I think you would benefit from unilateral training and also the. Uh, isometric component that's in there. I think those would both be extremely valuable to you. Follow the program and then then get back with him afterwards. Yeah, Andrew, what's your best lift, by the way, uh, uh, between squat, deadlift, and bench? Which one do you do best at in your age and weight category? Uh, squat right now. Okay. Well, you know what? Why don't you nice. Why don't you find yourself a squat meet? They have meets where you could just do a single lift. You don't have to do all three. That'll that that way you could still compete. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The problem is it's a. Uh... I already signed up. It's October October twenty second, so it's less than a month away. Um, okay. Was, uh, well, you don't have to do it, um, or you could do what I said and just bench real light, and then do. Yeah, heavy I think squat that's, I think that's the best advice. Yeah. I mean, I think you still go there. I mean, you're 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 going to be able to see who does the best squat, who does the best yeah. deadlift there, and you know who gives a shit about the the little trophy they give us and all that bullshit. You know what I'm saying? It's like that you're competing against yourself. You're trying to improve. You're going to see how you you line up. You know you're not going to be able to add your bench in there really because of how how light you're going to have to go. Yep. So what? Uh, how old are you, Andrew? I'm 19. Oh my god. Yeah, you, get the yeah. Whole you life got like, so much time. You got like you. you're going to be strong. You're going to be so much stronger in 10 years. <laughs> it's not even yeah. funny. Like take your time and goal. be and be careful. Don't don't. This is not like this is however strong you are now is not even close yeah, to where you're going to be. Listen to your body, man. That's, in 10 years, yeah, you're the good. Biggest thing. You're good, man. We'll send you map symmetry by the way if you don't have that. Okay. Thank you. You yep. got it, man. All right, man. Thanks for calling in. Yeah, thank you, guys. You got it. All right, dude. Yeah, I, I mean, you guys know what that feels like. It's like, oh, like yeah. it's everything. It's a total like, buzzkill. Yeah, know, yeah to dude. deliver that news, but that's what he needs to hear. And it's hard to turn off that focus, right? When you're when you have that mindset where you're like, I'm going to do this thing. Yeah. And you're in that mindset. The mindset basically says nothing will get in my way, and that's a good competitive mindset. If you want to succeed in anything, that's a good mindset. However. <laughs> You have to know when to turn it off. It's right. really hard to turn it off because now you're like, uh, well, I'm going to injure myself, which means I can't compete again, but I, I, I'm not going to let anything stop me. So you're in this like, what do I do? This struggle. Like, I'm going to finish this thing out because well, I'm so committed, but then it's going to hurt me and, this, and then I won't be able to do it again. This is where I look at there's an added element of responsibility on the coaches to really like maintain that kind of integrity of like not being like, yeah, just push through. Like, yeah. because the athlete is always going to, well, a good athlete is always going to have that mentality. Yeah. That this is just adversity. I could just push my way through it. Yeah. I'm still going to compete. I'm still going to do my best, you know, and that's what you want out of your athlete. But as a coach, you know, is this really setting them up for success or is just like deterring yep. them from then being able to pursue things in the future. Well, it sounds like his coach had already told him to back off. They were doing incline yeah. stuff. So it sounds like the coach knows they're doing it. What yeah. it sounds like to me was he's already got his answer from mom and he's coming to dad now <laughs> yep. and yeah. wants to see if dad has a different. Bro, he's 19 years old. I know. Same so, answer. Yeah. So you know, I would have been, I mean, he's way better than I would have been at 19. I wouldn't even have called anybody. I would have been like, I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, case in point, I had to have surgery. So. Yeah. 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 I mean, what are some stuff? I mean, I, the thing that comes to mind for me is like priming before he works out, like the wall circles, doing like overhead carries, maybe yeah. impacting the, the shoulder yeah. joint. Working like, on that depression uh, of the scapula, right. working on, all the stabilizer muscles, external rotation, and just overall stability. But, you know, because it's such a bench press is so limited by itself, and you're always, especially when you create this arch, you create this kind of force where it wants to push the shoulder up. Right. Well, that, and out, and that's, that's what causes the problem. Well, yeah, and so and and isn't the the answer to this is is building a very bulletproof shoulder, right? Yeah. I mean, just by getting and back by and with lots of stability and strength yep. because I mean, he's not, he's not weak, right? He obviously, yeah. he probably benches good weight and that he, but he's lifting in the same plane all the time. And so yeah. getting into the more kind of performance based exercises that we have in maps performance, mm -hmm. getting into the things like the stuff in prime and like getting good at that and overhead carry. So he can kind of bulletproof that shoulder. I mean, he's 19 years old. That's where my head goes right away. It's like, you need to spend your time doing all that, especially since you're nowhere close to your peak. You're right, going right. to get way stronger as exactly. time goes on. Our next caller is Arnold from Tennessee. Arnold, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey, guys. How are you doing? Uh, I just want to say real quick that after numerous years of watching uh, countless YouTube videos on fitness, wellness, and et cetera, I ran across the uh, Mind Pump um, channel a couple months ago, and you guys instantly became my favorite. 
Yeah, uh, winning. I went from a guy that looked didn't ever listen to podcasts to listen to you guys on a daily basis. It's, so I'm hooked. Not, real quick, Arnold, it's not because we're really good. It's because everyone else sucks really bad. Yeah. <laughs> we're the top of the shit pile. Yeah. yeah. All right. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm tallest midget. Let's go. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, Jesus Christ. All right. That, Thanks, Arnold. Continue. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so going into the question is. Um, for numerous years, I've been doing the uh, six to eight meals a day, trying to get my protein intake in. And then after doing that for quite a while, I developed, I, you know, I gained a little, uh, some pounds that I kind of wanted to get rid of. So I went into, uh, tried intermittent fasting about seven weeks ago. It began seven weeks ago. I lost 30 pounds rapidly. Uh, it's been absolutely amazing. The mood's been elevated. It's the best sleep that I've gotten since I was a teenager. Uh, my relationship with food is the best it's ever been in my entire life. So now that my body's kind of adapted to intermittent fasting and not losing any more weight, I want to stay. I want to stick to doing the 16-8 IF. But I'm concerned how, when I'm only eating three meals a day, how can I meet my daily protein requirement? I'm 144 pounds, and I try to get the one gram per pound. But how can I meet that requirement with three meals a day? And is there a way to improve how much protein can be absorbed per setting, given that you studies uh, indicate that it's only 20 to 35 grams per setting? Yeah. Okay. So there's a couple of things there, Arnold. First, you said all the right stuff about intermittent fasting. Now, I, I, I switched my mind as you were talking. At first, you said, I lost weight with intermittent fasting. I don't like fasting for weight loss because it could actually promote um, a bad relationship with food. It can promote bad behaviors. However, you did say things that then made me change my mind. You feel better. You have more energy. You're sleeping better. You have a better relationship with food, in which case I say, okay, there's then in this case, it sounds like it's all right. Now you said you weighed 144 pounds. I, I'm assuming you meant 244 pounds. You don't look like 144 no, no, Oh, pounds. sorry. Yes. Uh, I used to weigh 274 and now I weigh 244. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, now I did want to comment on your absorbing, your question about absorbing protein. Um, that's actually false. You can eat far more protein and absorb all of it. Um, it's really up to how well you digest it and how you feel. So this will be different from person to person. So if you eat, you know, 60 grams of protein at a meal and you feel okay, and you digest it okay, you don't notice any bloating or constipation or, or gastro issues, totally fine. Nothing wrong with that. The other thing is that you're 244 pounds. You can eat a, a gram of protein per pound of body weight, but also you, you can also just use lean body mass. I mean, do you know what your body fat percentage is sitting at? Do you have any idea where you're, where you're kind of at? No. And that's why that I've been kind of doing the one per pound thing. Okay. I, I think I think some of the studies indicate, what is it, 0.7 per yeah. lean mass? Yeah, I'd guess you'd be okay hitting 200 grams a Two, day would be plenty. 200 would be plenty. Yeah, 200, 200 a day, which was at uh, 65 roughly or 67 roughly a, a meal mm -hmm. uh, for three meals. And so just uh, bump your serving size. So if you normally eat, you know, six to eight ounces of meat with uh, your meal, do, you know, 10 to 12. And then uh, to Sal's point, pay attention to your digestion because some people can't. I mean, sometimes that is a lot of meat, or maybe they can't handle red meat that way. But then if they do like turkey or chicken, it doesn't bother them at all. So pay attention to what uh, digests well for you and sits well uh, after you eat that. And then just bump your meat, bump uh, the size of your, or the portion size of your meat, and you'll be fine. And you're a perfect example of somebody who I totally don't mind following like a 16-8 intermittent fasting window permanently because it works well for your life. It's improved your relationship with with food. Um, and I think all we just need to do is just bump uh, the ounces of meat that you're eating in each meal. Yeah. The other thing I would say too is you don't want to necessarily uh, – I, I get the structure around uh, intermittent fasting. No worries. I get the structure on intermittent fasting and why – how it can help some people, Okay. Um, but you don't want to get so obsessed with it that you're trying to fit everything into this window to the point where now that starts to feel like I'm stuffing myself. Yeah. It feels yeah dysfunctional. Like it's it it really isn't that big of a deal if you add a fourth meal and you know outside of that window. That, it really a, isn't. That's a great point, Sal. Because let's say let's say we did I, I bumped your protein. You come back and you're just like, oh man, I just added. I feel lethargic after these meals. It's just too much in one sitting. It just doesn't sit well with me. Yeah. I'd say, hey, let's uh, let's uh, cut your fast two hours earlier and eat a, a fourth meal. 
That's literally how I'd solve it. Like, there's mm-hmm. nothing magical about the 16. I know all the books and stuff, like, they try and sell it like it's this magical number for you. It's like, nah. What matters right now is you've improved your relationship with food. You're eating, you're making better choices. You're eating balanced meals. And if we are struggling with getting enough protein in your day, I would simply cut your, I would expand your eating window by two hours and front load another meal in there that's high in protein. That's so, that's how I would solve that. If, the eating bigger portion size doesn't sit well for with you and you don't like that. Yeah, it's really just about like paying attention to your body's feedback constantly because I mean, I went through this for a while. I was like religious about, you know, eating within this window and it, you know, to the point where I was doing it for about a year and I could feel, I could feel like, especially if I was cutting out breakfast for that long, I just didn't have that same energy after a while. So it changed. My body reacted to it differently after a while. So just, you know, keep in mind that, you know, it may not always, you know, keep working for you like it's working currently. So just, uh, you know, to, to make sure you pay attention to that. Yeah. And, and, you know, the benefits of fasting that you'll read about the cell autophagy, the reduced inflammation, neurogenesis, you know, neurogenesis. I mean, that's, that's really comes from the reduced calorie intake. Um, now there are cases where not eating at all, um, even when everything else is controlled is beneficial, especially with people with like inflammatory gut issues. Um, sometimes that's a good idea. But um, aside from the food relationship and, and, dare I say, spiritual aspects of fasting, which can have tremendous benefits for the right people, aside from that, the physiological benefits, when all the calories and macros are controlled and so long as you're not eating too close to dinner, uh, to, to sleep and all that stuff, it really doesn't make that, that big of a difference. In fact, you know, some people, what, what they'll do is they'll start with intermittent fasting, works for a while, then they run into what Justin runs into where... They're, they're, they're just, their cortisol gets a little out of whack. They need to eat something in the morning. Yeah, it was too catabolic. It, yeah, they start doing that. And then they say, they figure, oh, you know what? Once a month when I do a 48-hour fast, that seems to work best for me. I get the benefits of the fasting, but it happens once a month with 48 hours or something along those lines. So have that flexibility within your mindset um, and, and, and take it from there. But as far as the protein is concerned, I mean, you could try the bigger meals, 60 to 65 grams of protein in a meal is probably going to be very satiating. Personally, that might make me feel a little stuffed. If you start to feel like you're force feeding yourself to make it work, I would just add an extra meal. I I would stay, I would add an extra meal and cut the fast by a few hours. Excellent. Excellent. I read, uh, prior to, uh, running across the mind pump, uh, channel on YouTube and on Spotify, I ran across someone recommending taking digestive enzymes to assist with protein absorption. Is that a myth or is it actually something? No, that can help. That can definitely help, especially as you age. Uh, Mm -hmm. so as we age, we start producing less of these digestive enzymes. It's a very safe, uh, easy supplement to take, very inexpensive. We I work mean, with a company you, called- you, you take it almost every time, don't I, you? I take them with larger meals. Um, I take. Uh, we work with a company called Masszymes. I like them. I think they're more dedicated to creating enzymes for athletic populations. Um, so it, it, it won't hurt. And what you'll do you, when you take them, you'll notice if they help or not. So you'll use them and you'll know within a week, like this is, this is I like this or not, or I notice no difference, in which case don't take them anymore. But especially for people who consume larger meals, um, and especially as we age, you start to see some benefits from uh, consuming digestive enzymes, especially if you have things like your gall- gallbladder removed or any type of gut inflammatory issues. Okay. All right. Well, that's awesome, man. I really appreciate this opportunity, gentlemen. And thank you for what you're doing for the health and fitness community. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Arnold. Yeah. Thank you, Arnold. Thanks, appreciate man. it, man. Thank you. What if he was Captain America? Stupid. Yeah, I mean, stupid. <laughs> Retired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like I was the guy that <sighs> hung up my shield. You know, um, uh, it, it's so funny. Like, it, for, as soon as he said intermittent fasting, I lost weight. I was like, oh, I'm going to tell him this is the wrong thing to do. Uh, and then he was saying all that stuff. Like, oh, okay. No, he said the right things. Yeah. yeah. He said, all, he said, all, I would totally let him stay, uh, continue. Same. But, and Justin, great advice too, because, uh, and, and doesn't mean bo- it's work forever. Well, and what you both kind of touched on that I think is such an important point to go back to is that, more than and this by the way this applies to uh vegans carnivore yeah, diet going, keto right. diet like exactly the the part that this person is, the, the success that he's having is less about the intermittent fasting and it's more about the calorie reduction mm-hmm. the consistency with the balanced meals over and losing 30 pounds that's why he feels so good yeah. he could have done the it through keto he could have done it through vegan and more and most likely now 
what's okay too is to say, to say that hey this is what works he's maybe he's tried those other diets and those didn't work for him but this eating window thing worked really yeah. well with him and he said some the right things it's improved my relationship with food i've never ate so well my sleep is not good like oh dude let's stick to this but also let's not be so married to the protocol that now we're force feeding you in three meals and you're like oh my god adam to hit 200 grams it hurts my gut okay well then let's expand your eating window by two hours and add another meal in there yeah you know so it's just I, that's the problem with all the diets is people they have good success like he has had and then we become married to that like as it was the end all be all for you and it's like no that's not really why you felt really that's good. even true for workouts yeah. it's that's like right. you're not the same person uh that you were five years ago or even maybe last week right so things change your life changes your body changes and what happens is we do something and it works really well and it tends to stick in our mind. Like, man, I got in the best shape of my life when I did X, Y, and Z. Well, that doesn't mean it's going to be get you in the best shape of your life now 10 years later. You know, things change and uh, it tends to get us to ignore the signals of our body. Well, this is why people become yeah. so staunch about it too because they had success. Like, heaven forbid you try and tell them otherwise because like, I barely know the guy, right? And I, if I all of a sudden make that assessment, like, oh, it's not the diet, you're like, fuck you. I tried this, I tried yeah, this, I, I tried this. This is the only thing that worked and it worked amazing. Like, I'm not going to listen to some guy tell me this isn't this isn't it for me. Right. Yeah, you got to check yourself. Before you wreck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Our next caller is Ben from North Carolina. Ben, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Hey, guys. Um, so first of all, uh, I just want to thank you for having me on. I've been on the show before, and the fact it wasn't even that long ago, so the fact that you're having me on again uh, speaks a lot about y'all's willingness to provide continued support to all of us knuckleheads out there. So uh, we all really appreciate that a lot. Thank you. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so... I am kind of at a loss with my training and could use some direction. A little background, I'm 34, I'm uh, 5'11", 165 pounds. I've been training for about four years, really consistently for the last two. Uh, for a long time, I was doing kind of like Jay Perugia's programming, which is very much like um, lower training, six to eight reps, not a lot of barbell lifts because it's not being joint friendly and protecting the shoulders and stuff. And then over the past year to switch to some of the map style stuff. I have anabolic, I have performance and I have prime. Uh, I've run into some issues that have kind of impeded my ability to progress lately, which are um, for one, my shoulder, I have problems pressing. So right here on the front part of my shoulder, I have problems pressing right there. And unless I do like lots and lots and lots of ramp up sets, uh, or focus really, really hard on trying to train around it, but that pain just always kicks in. Um, and I've had to really scale back any kind of forward pressing stuff. And then I also have on this shoulder back here, um, which I think is either like mid trap or rhomboid right along the border of the scapula. It's just this chronic like ache and stiffness that kicks in a lot, not when I'm working out, but just throughout the day. And I saw Luna PT for that. Um, and we weren't really able to address it. She basically told me to just stop lifting for a while. She said, just use five pound dumbbells. You know, and so I did for a little while and pain went away. And then lo and behold, when I started training again, the pain came back. Um, and then on my left shoulder, I have pain on this top part right here in the lowering portion of overhead pressing. Uh, so I, even if I use like light resistance bands, it feels good on the way up. And then on the way down, I start to feel pain. Um, so that's my shoulders. I've never really been able to do the overhead barbell pressing because it just, my shoulders don't like it. Same with a uh, straight barbell bench pressing. Um, and then my low back gives me pain sometimes when I deadlift. I, straight bar deadlifting has always been an issue. I have to be like really, really, really methodical and attentive to technique. And even then, sometimes I still always kind of seem to tweak it, which bleeds into my squatting as well. Um, I, I know you guys have said that thoracic lack of mobility can cause compensation down there. Uh, so I know that I have some stiffness in the thoracic spine that I've been working on as well. So, you know, just with those problems, plus I have some sleep and adrenal type of issues, I'm trying to, which means I have to scale back the intensity with which I train so I can recover. I just kind of have all these different things I'm trying to juggle and I'm just not kind of not sure feeling a little directionless about how to move forward what do you do so, what do you do for work ben so uh i'm i'm a bartender that for right now but i'm actually um training to be a, a health coach and exercise professional so my head is filled with knowledge which doesn't make this any easier you know but um 
Yeah, bartending uh, for work right now. So the most the 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 red flag, or should I say that one of the more important things that you said was sleep and adrenal issues. So when I when I work with someone and it's and I hear pain in one area, then pain in another area, then pain somewhere else, and it's like, oh my gosh, there's all these areas that tend to bother this individual. Then what what tends to scream at me is that there's just there's too much stress on the body overall, just overall too much stress. So you have to scale it way down and focus really on getting your body back to normal, back to healthy. So what does that look like? Um, I'm not sure. You, depending on the program you're following, I would cut the volume way down. Map symmetry, bro. Yeah, yeah I, and map symmetry. Now that see, map symmetry would be great. However, I don't know if even that's too much volume considering some of what you're talking about. I would cut the volume way down. I'm going to send you map symmetry because I think that'll be the best program for you. But I'll cut, the, but keep it moderate intensity at highest, and keep the volume down. So whatever, if we say we ask for three sets or four sets, cut the volume down to one or two sets, and wait for your body to heal because your body's talking to you. And yes, there's there's definitely acute specific issues we can focus on, but the bigger picture looks like your body just overall is having a tough time um, adapting to whatever stresses you're putting upon it. Mm -hmm. And remember, stress can be lack of sleep. It could be lifestyle. It could be <clears throat> diet. It could be gut issues. That's often an issue. So try to figure out what you know. What are these these stressors? Get your body back to homeostasis, and then you can ramp up the volume. So I don't think you should stop exercising, but I do think you should really, really cut the volume down, really cut the intensity down, and focus on getting your body back to where it's starting to feel good. And also to, you know, as far as the shoulder uh, issues and instability. And, and so you said you had Prime or Prime Pro? I have Prime, yeah. yeah. Prime, okay. So, and you're doing the wall test specifically in, in okay, in, in some like uh, uh, shoulder circles and things to identify. I think that, um, you know, really taking an approach there with map symmetry, with adding in uh, other like uh, – addressing a lot of those instabilities. So say like a, a bottoms up kettlebell press where now, you know, I have to like the entire intention of that exercise is to address lateral stability in the shoulder. It, same thing being like, you know, any of the rotation elements of instability. So taking a, a kettlebell and, or a dumbbell and, and doing a, a, you know, a halo with that uh, and, and just kind of working very gradually on addressing where that um, you, you know, where that lies, where I can kind of peer into more to, to gain that kind of, you know, muscle tension to, to support around the shoulder and bulletproof it. So, um, you know, that would be my two suggestions as well as like overhead carries and really just like gradually taking that, um, you know, approach of just like trying to, uh, maintain support and packing the shoulder. Properly. I, I want to, I, mean, I want to make sure though, Ben, you understand what I'm saying though, is don't do more. Right. So what Justin's saying right now is changing what you're doing. Yeah, regressing it down to addressing the yeah, don't throw, instability. Don't throw more on top. You said adrenal issues. I, I, I want to ask you, how do, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Or how do you mean by that? Did you get tested for well, hormones? And well, No, so basically through all my research and you know the, the years of trial and error and stuff like that, and also my training. So I'm, I'm a board certified health coach. So I've gone through, a, I have a lot of different like pieces of, of resources to show what adrenal symptoms look like. Uh, you know, like waking up tired, even if you've already yeah. slept at night, uh, just fatigue throughout the day, like like lightheadedness when you stand up too fast. Those are all symptoms of like low blood pressure from adrenal issues and, you know, needing caffeine to get going in the day, you know, even though I don't drink that much. Um, you know, I, and, and I totally hear what you're saying about doing less and I'm very big about doing less. And I have been doing less for like the last couple months to just try and like find what that sweet spot is of like what volume is enough that I can recover adequately, but also don't like quit entirely. And it's been this like delicate dance I'm doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, have you but yeah, super fatigue type of stuff. Ben, have you gotten tested for, um, specifically for your hormones and any nutrient deficiencies? And have you had any gut health tests done? Yeah, I, I, so I did the minerals and metals test and the, um, candida metabolic test through the Cabral people. Oh, okay. Uh, and they, you know, we kind of got somewhere, but the main takeaway was that more testing is needed. Yeah. Unfortunately. Okay, so um, I, I would I would really work with them because because what you're telling me right now sounds like your body has an inability at the moment to deal with stress, mm -hmm. and you've already cut down things over the last two months and you still feel crappy. So yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. screams to me that there's something that we're that you haven't identified yet. 
And unless you identify it, doing more or less, whatever, I mean, you could get to the point where you do so little, you start to feel kind of okay, but then like, what do you do? You got to live there. So, um, uh, so I would work with Dr. Cabral's team and get to the bottom of this, figure out what the root is. It could be a gut issue. I mean, it really could be as easy as a gut issue and treating that and figuring out kind of what's going on there. It could also be, I mean, you did the toxicity test, I think you said. So I, I would go further with them and really find the root cause because it, again, what's, what's coming to me off what you're saying is your body seems to have an inability to deal with stress at the moment. Yeah. I mean, that's been, a, it's been a long, long standing journey of doing the detective work, just like trying out like, like, you know, I've taken a couple of their gut health protocols as per the recommendation of the health coach. And, you know, it's kind of like 50, 50, if I actually like got much out of it, you know, so I'm just, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm never giving up on it, but it's just, that's just kind of where I'm at right now. Yeah. Re yeah. Reframe, reframe the way you, you feel and think about it right now. I know it can be frustrating and, and feel daunting and stuff like that, but just, you know, because of the profession you're going to going into Ben, this is what's going to make you a great health coach. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, I see it as an opportunity to learn because I'm going to deal with people who have these kinds of problems as That's well. Right. So, yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, and I agree with Sal. Dive deeper into Cabral stuff. I mean, that guy is just a wealth of knowledge. So as much as you can go through with him and learn from him to, to help that. And then eventually, I do think that the program is symmetry. So I know Doug's going to send symmetry over to you because... Uh, and that that's addressing all the shoulder stuff that we're talking about. I just think the the unilateral work, the isometric work that's in there is going to be ideal for you and then complementing it with prime, which you already have. So I, yeah. I do think that's a move. But I do think that if you don't solve the root cause that's going on and it could be something gut related that, that Cabral could help you with, then it doesn't matter what we send you program wise. You're going to keep running the same issue. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm guessing to the best of my ability, but the testing is what's going to tell you. You know, I remember I had a client once who had these kind of neurological you know, uh, issues. She would feel like tingling and pain in her fingertips and we couldn't, we couldn't figure out what was going on. And mm -hmm. she thought she had to take more B vitamins. Maybe there's a, well, anyway, she finally convinced her to do lots and lots of testing. It took a while. You know what, you know what it was? She was taking too many B vitamins. It was the opposite of what she thought. So had she not done all that testing, she would have never figured it out. And it would have been one of these lifelong kind of issues, you know? So I, I'd say go through all the testing they recommend and get to the bottom. And once you figure that out, um, then your body's ability to adapt to stress will get back to normal. You can start training again. Yeah. Okay, cool. Right. And so if regarding symmetry, just, you know, don't, you know, scale back the volume and intensity of yes. it, but yeah. still be active. Just that's, that's the style of movement you'd recommend. Basically. Yes, yes, yes. Yep, but I would exactly. put, I would put the, I would put, uh, the functional medicine though, at the core of everything that you're doing. So if they say we want you to stop everything right now, I would listen to them. Yep. Sure. I'm happy to do that. Okay. It's not All right, Ben. Thanks for calling in, man. All right. Yeah. Thanks for your help guys. No problem. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a tough one, but I, you could tell after you could see it through his energy and stuff as he's talking. That's why I told him to reframe. Yeah. He's frustrated. That's yeah. why I was trying to tell him to reframe. Well, I could just way. also see that he's, his body seems fatigued, yeah. you know, and he's talking about shoulder pain, then shoulder pain, the back pain, then this, I'm like, Oh, your, your body's not adapting. Well, there's something. It's just screaming there. at you. Yep. It's just screaming at you from all angles. And it's less about all those areas. And it's more about what's going on inside. Right. For sure. Yeah. It's just I sort mean, of pressures the hinges at that point. These are the guys that end up, uh, these guys and girls that make incredible coaches. That's true. You know, because they went through so much trying to solve all these issues and problems. And then, and then when they do, I mean, they have a, they have an ability to communicate at a, at a, at even even deeper level than I can communicate this information to him because he's gone through this journey. And there's a lot of people that do this that just they think it's the shoulder, they think it's this, and there's this underlining issue that they're not addressing. Dude, I, when I had my 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 worst gut issues, I had to devote a year a year to to solving that issue, and that meant I didn't train the way I used to like to train. That meant I couldn't eat the way I like to eat. But after that year, it, it was like, I, mean, I, I got back to normal. Now, I, I could have ignored it and pushed and cut the volume down and tried to do all this other stuff. And it would have just, it would have never fixed itself. So you, you got to get the root to the root cause. And if you're noticing chronic compiling issues, mm -hmm. then it may not be the shoulder. It may not be the hip. It may not be the knee. It may be something deeper that's preventing your body from being able to adapt. Well, I remember how hard it was in that environment of like being a bartender, like to, to get adequate sleep and yeah. just what kind of stress it brings. So it's like, you know, maybe a product of the environment on top of other things. So yeah, it just has to get down to what's really causing it all. Yeah. Look, if you like mind pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com. 
and check out our guides. We have free guides on there that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is also on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can only find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press, and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps, and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out, and less injury. That's another thing. You'll see less injury as well.